This is a production of PBS Charlotte. The following episode of Charlotte Cooks is brought to you by Central Piedmont Community College and viewers like you. Thank you. Hi there, I'm Chef Pamela Roberts and welcome to this edition of Charlotte Cooks. Have you ever wanted to make bread at home but didn't really know how, think it's way too complicated? Well, you can make bread in a very complicated way or you can make bread in a very simple way. I have made bread for my family ever since my son was born and it is just one of those things that's really very easy to do. My grandmother used to make bread for all of her family. She got married to my grandfather and she had a yours, mine and ours kind of family with lots of mouths to feed and every day she'd wake up and she'd have loaves of bread over every heating vent in the house. The house smelled marvelous. So today I'm going to show you a very simple loaf of bread that you can make. It can be done in less than two hours. You can have delicious fresh bread for your family where you know exactly what's in it and it's just going to be delicious and irresistible and you'll probably never go buy a commercial loaf of bread again once you know how to do this. So what are we going to use? We are going to use flour. Okay, flour. How much flour are we going to use? We're going to use three and a half cups of flour. I'm going to use a good size mixer because my mixer is going to knead this for me. I'm not going to have to knead it myself. So I'm going to take three and a half cups of flour. So how am I going to measure my flour? I'm going to take my measuring cup. Now a lot of times people will say, oh, we're just going to measure flour by putting it in there like this. No, you can't do that. You can't also take flour and put it in like this. Okay? We have to measure our flour in a very specific way because one thing we don't want to do is pack our flour into the measuring cup. So basically you're going to lightly scoop the flour and you're going to take a flat edge knife and you're going to scrape it from halfway to the back and then you're going to take it all the way forward. That is one level cup of flour and that's how you measure flour. Okay? It makes a big difference. Now if you're measuring and your recipe calls for eight ounces of flour, then you've got to get out a scale and you have to weigh eight ounces of flour. You can't say, well, I know a cup is eight ounces. I'm just going to put a cup because a cup of flour does not weigh eight ounces. It only weighs about four and a half ounces. And so if you try to do that with your recipes, you're going to find that your recipes are not working out and you're going to say, I hate making bread, but it's not really that hard to do, so you just have to be accurate. Now I need three and a half cups of flour, so I got one and a half there now, so let me get another two, okay? You always want to make sure you get this little back end here filled because this is the one area right back here that usually leaves a little air pocket, okay? So what kind of flour am I going to use? Well right now you could use just regular what we call all-purpose flour or AP flour. And that's okay. It's not the best for bread, but it's okay if that's what you had. It'll make a decent loaf. You can also use a high gluten flour, and you can also use bread flour. Bread flour and high gluten flour are basically what allows the bread to stretch, and we're going to be seeing that stretch happen after we get this mixed. And so in our bowl, we have got our flour, and the next thing we're going to add to this is our yeast, our salt, a little bit of sugar, and then we're going to add water and oil. It's just a very simple bread, okay? Now, if you wanted to add whole wheat flour to this, you can, but you have to realize that with whole wheat flour, the, if, if, even if you looked at whole wheat flour, it's really coarse, and you could feel the little sharp edges on it, and so what happens with that is it doesn't allow the bread to actually rise as high as if you just had a regular uh, bread flour or a non-whole wheat flour. Could you use chia seeds? Could you use all kinds of different things in here? Yeah, you can, but I'd really like you to get used to making the basic loaf first before you start adding other things to it. I'm gonna add a little bit of sugar. Now in here, I've got some coconut sugar. You can use regular white sugar. You can use organic sugar. I'm using a little bit of coconut sugar because I think it adds just a really nice little dimension of flavor. It's not a whole lot of flavor. You won't say, oh, look, there's coconut sugar in this. 
it's just a nice flavor to add, okay? It also provides, well, the sugar provides a little bit of food for the yeast. The yeast we're using here is one and a half tablespoons of yeast. Now let's talk about yeast for a second. We have all different kinds of yeast. The kind of yeast that we're going to use today is an instant yeast. Some recipes will call for your yeast to be sprinkled over warm water and let it sit for about 10 minutes until it comes foamy and you can see it bubbling and whatever. That is a yeast that needs to be activated. A lot of times yeast is very dormant in its state that it's dried and you have to activate it to kick it into life, so to speak, in order for it to start its rising activity. And so when we use instant yeast, we don't have to do that adding it to the water bit, okay? So you can just take your yeast, if you're using instant yeast, which is what we're using today, and it's my favorite yeast to use because I'm impatient and I just like to keep on going. I don't like to have to stop and wait for the yeast to decide to wake up a bubble. This is already ready to rock and roll. So I'm going to take the yeast and I'm going to put it on the opposite side of the bowl from where I put my sugar and my salt. And the reason for that is, is that the salt will inhibit the yeast activity, but the sugar increases the yeast activity. And so we want to make sure that we just get this on opposite sides so when we start adding our water, it's, the yeast isn't going to go, no, I have to be dormant, oh, I have to be active. It's going to just go, I'm going to be active when it gets the water, okay? So I've got this all set up in my bowl. I'm going to put it on my mixer. And you're going to need a heavy duty mixer for this. And for this, we're going to use a dough hook. A dough hook is this. It looks like a curly pigtail, okay? This is wonderful for kneading, okay? When you're kneading your bread, you can get a good upper arm workout and you could spend a good half hour kneading bread, or you can go ahead and use your dough hook. And in our case, when you use a dough hook and a commercial mixer or any kind of a big heavy duty mixer like this, you're only gonna need to let it process for 10 minutes. So I'm gonna start with a low speed and get my flour all mixed up here. It's going to mix in the flour and the yeast a little bit, and now I'm going to take my water. My water needs to be about 110 degrees, all right? 110 degrees is gonna feel warm. I have this in a mason jar. Guys, mason jars are like the kitchen miracle. You can heat them up, you can freeze them. You know, they're wonderful. They're wonderful tempered glass. It's not going to break on you, unless you drop it, of course. So now I've got my water in here. This is one and a half cups of water, and I'm going to add one tablespoon of olive oil. Our olive oil, I like adding it to the water because then it just goes into the mixer and mixes in with the rest of the yeast and the flour and everything else and makes a nice dough, as opposed to putting the water in and then adding the oil, and it takes a while longer for it to get incorporated. So here we go. We're just gonna take this and we're going to drop it right in slowly along the edge. You don't want to have your mixer speed up too high at this point, and the reason for that is you're going to be wearing a lot of flour if you do. Because what does flour do when it's agitated? It gets airborne and goes everywhere. So as this is coming up, we're going to increase our speed slowly, and we're going to let it knead for 10 minutes. Sometimes you're going to have to get a spatula and help it along a little bit and scrape it down. And it's always a good idea to be prepared to scrape down your bowls no matter what. Now this dough, when you look at it, you're going to think, oh, it's, it's a little on the wet side. And that's a good thing. It should be. And if you need to add a little more water to it, you certainly can. I'm going to let this all come together into a nice dough mass. One of the things I want to caution you about this dough is it is a wet looking dough and so if you feel like the dough is too wet you can add a little flour but I would really try to resist adding any extra water to this because the wetter the dough the more your dough is going to have big holes in it and it's just, just, it's just really kind of nice. Okay so I'm going to let this sit for 15 minutes. After 15 minutes it's going to look like this. Okay? And so now it's ready to shape. And how are we going to shape this? We're going to take it and we're going to put it on our cutting board. So I'm going to take a little bit of flour and I'm going to dust my bench with it. It's just a cutting board on a counter, but I can call it a bench. Okay, just a little bit of flour. You don't want a whole lot, okay? I'm going to use a bowl scraper. Bowl scrapers are marvelous. You see the little curved edge? That's for getting the inside of the bowl. 
this side for cutting. It's wonderful. Okay, I'm just going to turn this, turn it right out. Come on out. There we go. I'm going to set that aside. Now, if the dough is very sticky, what you want to do is you want to take a little bit of flour and dust the surface of the dough so all the sticky parts have a little bit of flour on it. Okay? And flip it over a couple times. Shake it up. <laughs> Let's look at this. This is so cool. You guys are going to fall in love with working with dough. Dough is just the bomb, so to speak. The dough bomb. Okay. So if you're feeling that the dough is at all sticky, you're going to want to go ahead and put a little flour down. Okay. So now, this is a ciabatta loaf. And so a ciabatta loaf typically is rectangular in shape. But I also find that this bread makes really good sandwiches and really good French toast and really good bread that you might need for whatever it is that you might need. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to roll it out into a rectangle. And notice I'm not really even rolling it. I'm pushing it with my hands. And notice it shrinks back a little bit. Sometimes when it shrinks back like this, you're going to want to take your cellophane and you want to let it rest a little bit, okay? Just cover it with a piece of cellophane five or ten minutes. That's all you have to do because it's tired from working out. It's just been worked out on that whole dough hook thing. I mean, if you sat there on that dough hook thing for ten minutes, you'd be kind of worn out too. That's why we let it rest for fifteen minutes. And when you come back to this, like I said, if it's pushing and pulling on you, then it needs a little bit more of a rest, okay? So you can take this now, get it nice and even. We're going to roll it up. Don't worry about bubbles. Bubbles, I think, are a good thing because that's going to ensure that we're going to have nice, airy insides. Pinch your bottom seam together. Roll him over. Now we're going to get a sheet pan, and we're going to make sure it's lined with parchment. You can also use this with a silpat. A silpat or those silicone baking sheets, you're just looking for something to make it not stick to the bottom of the pan. Do you have to use parchment? No. Can you put it directly on the pan? Yes, if you sprayed it or put oil on the bottom of it. I just like this. It's easier to clean up. You know, you just take, throw the paper away. Put a little bit of cornmeal. And cornmeal is one of your best friends for doing bread products and keeping them from sticking on things. I'm going to take my loaf. He looks kind of funky, doesn't he? He looks really funky. But you know what? It's great. It's really great. It's not supposed to be perfect, okay? Put this on your sheet pan here, and you're going to let it rise for 45 minutes, okay? So then, cellophane over it, and if you have a proofing element on your stove, put on the bread proofing and pop this in there. It should take 45 minutes for it to get really big. Let me show you. See what I mean? Really big. You're going to take this cellophane off very, very carefully. Now at this point, this is oven ready. So one thing we have to watch out for, when you put bread in the oven, let me show you something. Sometimes you see slashes on the top. This bread was not slashed on the top. And what happens with that, when you put the bread in the oven, we have a phenomenon that's called oven spring. And what that is, is the yeast, when it hits the heat, it goes, woo, and it gives its last hurrah. It, go, it gives its last whoo, final rise. It's really kind of cool to watch. It's really very, very cool to watch. It just goes, whoa, and it gets a little bit bigger. If you don't slash the tops of these, you get this thing going on. Doesn't make the bread inedible, makes the bread kind of ugly. But what this is, is that this had nowhere to go. And when you slash the top, what it does is it gives that rising, that last oven spring, somewhere to go so that you can control the shape of your loaf and you don't end up with a blowout like this, okay? Would we still eat this? Oh yeah. All right, so let me go pop this into the oven. A couple things you can do with this. You can take a, uh, a brush and brush it with water so you have water on the top. You can take it and you can mist it with a, a water bottle and get water on the top. You can leave the water off of it altogether. What the water does is it adds an element of steam and what that does is it makes the crust really, really crispy. 
really, really hard and very, very thin. And so this is ready to go in the oven. I'm going to slash this so you guys can see how to slash. Okay, what do you need? Some people will use something called a baker's peel, which is, looks a lot like a razor blade. Some people will use a razor blade. Some people will use a scalpel. But I bet more people have serrated knives in their kitchens than they do scalpels or razor blades or anything like that. So quickly, I'm going to make two slices across the bread. And then this has got to go in the oven like now. Because if it doesn't, what it's going to happen is it's all going to sit there and lose all its energy and totally deflate and go flat. Okay, so this happens just as we're putting it in the oven, all right? So you're ready? Here we go. Into the oven we go. Phew, okay, so the hard work is done now. And really, that wasn't even very hard, was it? Really, honestly, guys, when you make this bread, you can sit down, you could mix the stuff, it's got to sit for 15 minutes, you can go have a cup of tea. Then you can come back. Shape it, let it sit for 45 minutes. And that 45 minutes, you're heating up your oven. And then you could go have another cup of tea or you can get on the computer, do Facebook, do whatever you want. And then put it in the oven for 30 minutes, let it bake. And then it's done. It's done. Very little hands-on time. And it's really remarkable how wonderful fresh bread is. But I wanted to show you this blowout bread. What are you gonna do? Commercial bakers wouldn't sell this. But at home, we'd scarf it up no problem. So let's see what it looks like when we cut it. Should I cut it in the middle? Yeah, let's cut it in the middle. We're gonna see what it looks like. So now we see we've got the nice big holes in there that's very characteristic of ciabatta bread. When you slice bread, what not to do and what to do. I'm gonna use this piece for the not to do. Sometimes when I've seen people come up and cut bread, first of all, make sure you use a serrated knife, okay? Serrated knives are very sharp, and serrated knives are going to cut through the crust and they're going to cut through the bread without crushing it, okay? So I've seen people come up and do bread where they mash it all down, okay? You don't want to mash it down. What you want to do is let the bread, you want to make sure the teeth on your knife cut through the crust and then saw it back and forth. You're not putting any downward pressure on your knife at all, okay? Watch that again. You're going to let it the knife grab, look at that texture of that bread. <laughs> Watch this. See, sometimes it'll slide across the top, let those teeth catch, and let it come right on down. Okay, so you've got this bread, and you have lots of bread left from all kinds of things at home. Now we know how to slice a piece of bread, put this on a plate. So what if we did French toast, and we wanted to make stuffed French toast? Okay? Well, first of all, we'd have to find a bread that didn't have this big hole in it. Okay, so let's find one. There we go. You notice that this bread has got a little different sheen on the surface. What did we do to it when it came out of the oven? We brushed it with a little bit of olive oil. You can brush it with a little bit of butter. It just makes the crust a little bit more tender. So, we're talking about stuffed French toast. We're going to take the end off the bread. My husband, he would like die for this. He loves this piece of bread. I usually put them on the side to let him eat them because I like the center. <laughs> Cut a nice thick piece. All right. And then to make it stuffed, you're going to take your knife and you're going to cut a little pocket into it. Okay. See how I'm doing that? Just cutting a little bitty pocket into this bread. And then inside of this pocket, we are going to take Oh, you know, one of my favorite for stuffed French toast <laughs> is goat cheese. It sounds crazy, but I like to take goat cheese and put a little bit of honey in it. And I'll make a little bit of it and I'll put it inside there. Ha ha ha. Just put it inside there and then you dip this into egg wash. Put it in your pan and serve it with a blueberry syrup. Hello, I'm stuffed French toast. That's the way to do that, folks. But look at this bread. This is really nice. Look at that. Isn't that a nice crumb? This is what we look at when we're looking at bread. What is the crumb like on the bread? The crumb is this density that we have inside the bread here. Sometimes we have a loose crumb. Sometimes we have a tight crumb. Like we were talking here with this big air pockets. You know, some ciabatta is very, very, very common to have big air pockets. And that is because the dough is wet. Okay? So I want to show you 
what it's like to make bread in a commercial kitchen. Because obviously, in a commercial kitchen, you don't make one loaf at a time. And we also don't make it by the cup. We actually would take this and measure this out and find out how many pounds of flour one loaf needs. And we usually process this in 10 loaves or more. And we've got a production kitchen back here. So let's go down here and take a look and see how we're going to make 10 loaves of bread at one time. This is normally how bread is made. Instead of making it one loaf at a time like we're doing at home, this is a 10 pound loaf of dough. And we are going to scale this out now into our individual loaves. Each individual loaf will weigh about 18 ounces. And so what they're going to do is they're going to cut off a piece of the dough and weigh it until they get 18 ounces. Once they get 18 ounces, they're going to pass it down to the crew then who is going to shape the dough. And so the dough at this stage has been resting for 15 minutes. It's kneaded for 10 minutes and now it's rested for 15 and it's totally ready to shape. Are these ready to go? You're ready. All righty, let's bring these down here to the shaping crew. There you go. There's one and here's another one. We're gonna take it and we are going to put a little bit of flour on the bench, not a whole lot, just a little, just to keep it from sticking. You certainly don't want this to be sliding around on your bench. We're gonna take this and we're gonna flatten it out into a nice rectangle, because we're making ciabatta. Ciabatta usually is in a rectangle, and if it's not in a rectangle, it doesn't matter. This is not going to be like your traditional ciabatta in that it's gonna have a very fine grain, very small holes in it. So we're just gonna make into nice little loaves, we're going to put them on the rack. We're going to put them in this giant oven. And this oven is more like a phone booth that we have. And that's that loud noise you hear, is the engine and the fans of that oven. And this whole rack will be lifted up, and it's going to rotate in that oven and bake the bread. The beautiful thing about this oven is that it also adds steam to the bread. That's what gives that nice, hard, crispy crust is the steam. At home, we're just gonna take it, we're gonna spray a little water, or take a little brush and brush some water on the surface of the bread so the surface of the bread is moist. And so that when it's done, it's gonna be crispy. I would not ever take water and spray it inside of your home oven because if that cold water hits the light bulbs in your home oven, it's gonna explode. So we don't wanna do that. So this is how bread is made on a larger scale. You can practice making bread, and guess what, guys? If you want to practice making bread, your neighbors will love you because what are you going to do with all this bread when you're done making it? If you don't eat it all, you can take it to your neighbors and your neighbors will think you're the best thing since sliced bread. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so I'm going to slice this all the way down and there we go. We got a loaf of sliced bread and yeah, look at there's those nice holes in there. Okay, garlic bread. You can take a slice of bread, put it in the toaster. Believe it or not, toaster. Take a raw piece of garlic and just rub it over the toasted bread. And you're going to have a garlic bread. And it's going to be phenomenal. You don't have any extra butter or anything like that. But you can make wonderful croutons out of this like that, too. So here we have our lovely loaf of bread that's sliced. And I'm going to shingle this out a little bit so you can actually see it. Get on there. There we are. Here's our bread. All nice and sliced. Ta -da! And then we also have loaves. We can take a nice loaf of bread that is done. Ta -da! Wrap that up in a nice little dish towel or a nice little piece of parchment. Or you can even go to the store and find some nice tissue papers to wrap them up in and give them away as gifts. Who doesn't like homemade bread, for crying out loud? So I hope you try this recipe and just let me know what you do with it because there's so much to do with a loaf of bread. But make your bread at home. That way you know what's into it. Play with your flours. Once you get this recipe down, play with adding some whole wheat flour to it. And what I would do with that is just use a little bit and not replace it all with whole wheat because you would just get a pancake. But you can use some amaranth flour. You can use quinoa flour. You can use a lot of different flours to add nutrition to it. You can mix in cooked grains, like if you had leftover brown rice, or if you have some quinoa, or even some farro. You can take that and stir that into your dough, so you're going to 
get some mixed grains and some different things into your bread to make it more than just a lovely white bread. But because you made this yourself and you know what quality of flour you bought and you know the quality of all your ingredients, this is so much better than a plain old white bread you would buy in the grocery store. You can get our recipes on pbscharlotte.org or you can email me at pamela, P-A-M-E-L-A dot roberts, R-O-B-E-R-T-S at cpcc dot edu. I'd love to hear from you. Let me know how you made your bread. Let me know if it worked for you. I'm sure it will. Thank you for watching this episode of Charlotte Cooks and I'll catch you again next time. of PBS Charlotte.